I fear that I'm repeating myself again. I did an episode last season on minimalism called, I think, a minimal take on minimalism. But I guess I wasn't quite done with this. And after all, isn't that the point with minimalism? Repetition, repeating myself again and again and again. And, okay, I'm going to stop with the broken cord. In this episode, however, I'm going to elaborate on what I talked about in that first episode on minimalism, even though I don't remember what I talked about and I don't go back and listen to these things. In this episode, I'm taking on the man himself, Philip Glass. We'll see where this goes. Stay tuned. First, this. Hey, it's Peter Saltzman. If you love improvisations on the ledge, please be so kind as to spread the word, give it five stars and a great review. And to keep up to date with all of my activities, including this podcast, new albums, performances, and music education, be sure to visit my website at petersaltzman.com. Enjoy the show. Okay, enough of the chord. My friend, Eric Forsberg filmmaker and the funniest person I've ever known introduced me to minimalism, actually introduced me to Philip Glass about 40 years ago. So I'm 19, I'm guessing. He brought a record over to my basement lair when I was living at home and he played this something I'm thinking from an opera of Philip Glass. This is, what, 1980. And maybe it was Einstein on the beach. I don't know. But I was horrified. I couldn't stand it. First of all, let me just say this outright. Opera normally gives me the willies. I do like Bizet Carmen. I think that's fantastic. And I like some Mozart. Don Giovanni. I can listen to three to seven minutes of Wagner before I start getting a headache. First of all, I said first of all already, but this is an episode on minimalism. So first of all, first of all, first of all, Wagner, I don't like that style of singing, operatic style. Okay, we'll leave that alone. That's another episode. But anyway, my friend Eric put this music on the turntable, and I was immediately taken aback by the excess of repetition to my mind, which is the only mind that I've ever occupied. And to be fair to Eric, he had every right to play something for me because I was always foisting John Coltrane records on him, McCoy Tyner records, Cecil Taylor records, Beethoven records. Eric's preferences were Philip Glass and Wagner, the aforementioned opera composer. There is something in common between these two, after all, my dear friend Eric, if you're listening. They tend to go on, Glass and Wagner. There is something not in common between these two, of course, in that Philip Glass is Jewish and Wagner was a notorious anti-Semite. And that Philip Glass is a good person. Wagner was a horrible person. May his bones be crushed. But the length. Now, Wagner was about what he called endless melody, endless melodic development. The same can't be said for Philip Glass. Philip Glass, like many composers from early 20th century onward, are terrified of melody, something I'll talk about later. When I say melody, I mean not just a singable song, but something that has a sense of story, narrative, something that develops along melodic lines. This is, in fact, one of my complaints about minimalism and most modern so-called composition, that it avoids melody. It avoids a sense of song. I love songs. So this episode is really ultimately about my own preferences and my own battle with the norm in 20th and 21st century composition, which is, to my mind, avoidance of melody and narrative. And yet, in preparation for this episode, 
I listen to a lot of Philip Glass, only Philip Glass. I'm, I'm not going to get into Steve Reich or John Adams or Terry Riley or any of the others whose music is associated, fairly or not, with this school of composition, minimalism. And I listen to a lot of it. And there is, I have to admit, and I've thought this for years, something very attractive about it. To be honest, I listen to it almost exclusively while working out in the morning doing my stationary bike, doing yoga. And it's great for that in a lot of senses because the repetition, the power of repetition is energizing. It's fun to listen to. It doesn't make a lot of demands on your attention. Is that a bad thing? Maybe not when you don't want to pay attention. A lot of music is that way. It's great to work out to, but if you actually sit down and listen hard, listen for a story, It starts to fall apart because there is no story. EDM is that way, electronic dance music. Throughout the episode, by the way, I'll be interspersing my talking with my own improvisations in a minimalistic style. These will be segments of those improvisations because true to the minimalistic style, they tend to go on. You can hear the complete improvisations on a special album I'm setting up on Bandcamp called Breaking Glass. I'll tell you more about that later. Here's the thing. There is something enjoyable about it, but it tends to lack for me that sense of narrative. But here's the other thing. Repetition is already a main feature of music before minimalism, before any ism. Repetition, it could be said, is in fact the first rule of music, organized sound. Without repetition, there is no music. So that aspect of minimalism The repeated figures, the as one reviewer in the L.A. Times back in the 90s, I forgot his name, but it was a very funny quote. He was reviewing a uh, Philip Glass concert, and he called it the music of the Xeroxed arpeggio. so on. I mean, really, so on. Maybe a better term nowadays would be copy and paste. And I always say, beware of copying and pasting when it comes to music. It's very easy to just copy a section, whether it's in a score or in a DAW, digital audio workstation on your computer. You just copy a region and you can keep going. Now, this has great uses in terms of like mocking up a piece of music, but It's dangerous, of course, in the sense that it can make you lazy about composing. And in that sense, I think of EDM as kind of the stepchild of minimalism, in that it involves a lot of loops, looping, looping, looping ad infinitum with changes over the course of those loops, adding a hi-hat, adding a cute synth line, then subtracting, taking things away. It's a very mechanical form of composing to my mind. And minimalism often sounds this way to me as well. You start with an idea, a simple idea that repeats, like I was just doing. Yeah. 
Dad. I can't play today. Anyway, and then you add things to it, and you keep adding things, and then you subtract. And it's a valid form of developing musical ideas. This has been going on for centuries. Composers have done this. So what's the problem? For me, the problem is I hear the math too much. The math is too audible to me. Literally, in some minimalist compositions, you'll hear people, singers, the chorus or whatever, counting. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. I think that's in uh, Einstein on the Beach by Philip Glass. And what is the point of this? It's to put perhaps the underlying structure of music in the forefront. Make it clear what's going on. This is maybe similar to the architecture of the Bauhaus, putting the underlying framework up front. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. It awakens the listener to what's really going on in music. Music is, in fact, a mathematical language. It's a sound of math moving in time, the sound of math. But the difference between what I consider great music, great composition, great songs, and music that sounds good, is mathematically precise, is that the math recedes into the background. The narrative pulls you in like a true story. It may be the problem with the idea of minimalism in general, not just in music, but in the plastic arts as well, or architecture, that it's too symmetrical. Now, to be fair, Glass is a genius at coming up with surprises within that structure. He'll do fascinating, fascinating rhythm. That's a Gershwin tune. Fascinating rhythms that evolve over the top of this very repetitive structure. And it's attractive. It pulls you in. It's great music to work out to. But I always say, be wary of music that is great to work out to or great to go to sleep to. Because it's inherently a kind of background music, kind of wallpaper. I still feel like music that doesn't require that much of your attention span that you can work out to or be put to sleep by is missing something. Now, this may be the point. Why does music have to have a story? Why does it have to have a narrative? Why do we need to have to concentrate to focus to enjoy it? Well, you've got a point, and Glass has a point. It may just be that that's my thing, that music is an all-encompassing art at its best. It doesn't need anything else. It doesn't need pictures. It doesn't need dancing. It doesn't need anything other than the sounds interacting. That's an ideal, to be sure, but that doesn't mean that it's the only way to make music. And in that sense, Philip Glass and others of this school are the masters of creating music 
that can just get inside you without involving your full intellect, your full spirit. So let me get back to my point about repetition in music. As I said, this is the first rule of music. You play or sing something. Now that just randomly happens to be a theme from um, the Pathetique Symphony by Tchaikovsky. So what does he do after that? So he repeats it, right, with a variation. Then he varies it. That is a descending little line. And he does that again, down a step. Think of that as the little B part of the melody. And then... I'm not sure if that's exactly right, but it's filled with repetition. The difference there and in so much what I consider great music is, again, the sense of movement. A story is in that melody. Let's look at another example of repetition in a more fundamentally repetitious way. Beethoven. I talk about him a lot, don't I? In the Seventh Symphony, as Wagner called it, the apotheosis of dance music. At the end of the first movement, Beethoven repeats a bass line in the basses and cellos, I think like 17 times. It goes like this. I'm not sure if it's in the right key. Over that, However, go listen to it, Seventh Symphony in A major. Over that, however, there is an incredible sense of development, a build that is extraordinary, that makes the repetition come alive. And it's not a mathematical sense of it. It's a melodic, powerful narrative that's developing. You just feel like this is going to explode. It just gets louder and louder, and the textures grow over that Something like that. I don't have the score in front of me. The sense of excitement is unbelievable. If you hear a performance of this live, and it's a good performance, like I heard recently before the pandemic took over, Sir John Elliott Gardner brought his orchestra to Chicago and did all nine Beethoven symphonies. And I was lucky enough through the auspices of my parents to go hear all of this. And it was extraordinary. But it is a dance symphony. And it's all about rhythm, repeated rhythm. Perhaps you could work out to this. 
but only if you looped certain sections, because that's just part of the story. What I just played you is the culmination of a lot of storytelling in that first movement. Now, an EDMer would probably sample that, just repeat it, not 17, but 147 times, and take all the storyline out of it. But this kind of repetition, by the way, after the Seventh Symphony was premiered in Vienna in whatever year, 1807 or 12, or I don't know, the composer Carl Maria von Weber, is that how he pronounce it, wrote a scathing review saying about that particular spot that I was playing you, that Beethoven's was ripe for the madhouse because he repeated something that many times. But getting back to my dear friend Eric and my argument with him in 1980 when he first presented Philip Glass's music to me, my argument against it was that what's the big deal about the repetition? It's already a hallmark mark of American popular music, jazz, pop, rock, what are they really adding by just repeating things over and over? That's a pentatonic scale, and you know what that's the beginning of. In jazz, all over the place, I'm thinking of a tune by Coltrane, I believe it's on... uh, Coltrane sound. I can't remember the name of it right now. McCoy Tyner plays that chord progression over and over for maybe several minutes. And Coltrane eventually, another pentatonic scale, does... It keeps going on like this, and you wonder, as the listener, is this going to just keep going on like this? Is there a point? Is there a larger point to this song, to this music? And in fact, there is. It goes into something else. It builds up. I don't remember it exactly, but it ends up being a blues, I think. And there's a tension, like in the Beethoven. There's a tension that continues to build because of the repetition, but also because of the sense that it's clearly going somewhere. And when it arrives, it's glorious, like the sun coming through the clouds. The repetition is broken, and that's the key, breaking the repetition, breaking the glass. Breaking the symmetry is the key to making great music, setting it up, then breaking it. So that's my take on repetition. But the counter argument to that, I would say, from the minimalist point of view, is that Glass and others are building a different type of aesthetic altogether, where, as I said, the repetition is on the surface, and the repetition is the aesthetic. All well and good. It works in that sense, completely. Again, I will say, there's something incredibly attractive about the music. It's clean. Even with all the weird little rhythms that Philip Glass uses, and and they're very cool, I would say much more interesting than EDM, by the way. But even with it, there there's like something cool going on, an asymmetry within the symmetry. So I applaud him for that. It's highly original. It's different. 
it works aesthetically in its own right. So why not give in to it? Why not just accept it for what it is? Well, a part of me is resistant because it feels, uh, frankly, a little cultish, this school of music. Like, you just got to accept it. Let go. Let your mind go. It's, I suppose that's very zen. I'm probably not very zen. I'm kind of chill, but not zen. And maybe it's not really zen. I don't know enough about Zen Buddhism to say that's what it's about. That's a superficial, popular aspect of Zen Buddhism, letting go. So there's this cultish aspect to it. And to be fair to Philip and Steve Reich, John Adams, they were reacting to something in the so-called classical music circles, the modern school of composition, which was serialism, as founded by Arnold Schoenberg and then taken to its logical or illogical extreme by composers like Milton Babbitt. And it was a very hyper-intellectual form of music that, for most people, is almost impossible to listen to. It has no familiar sense of melody and taken to its logical extreme rhythm or anything else. Now, that's also unfair. Just as I'm kind of generalizing about minimalism, I'm generalizing about serialism, the 12-tone dodecaphonic school of composition as founded by Schoenberg in the early 20th century. But it does describe the general tenets of that, which is uh, hyper-intellectualism, an avoidance of traditional melody, and of course, an avoidance in most cases of traditional tonality, Anton Berg's violin concerto notwithstanding. But minimalism, in its original form, in any case, was a reaction to this hyper-intellectualism. Glass and Riley were saying, enough of this. This is unlistenable. It's time to get back to the basics, back to the fundamentals of music. And that they did in the sense that, as I said, the fundamental feature of organized sound is repetition. Now, to my mind, they overdid it. Or they threw out the baby with the bathwater in that you don't have to get rid of the other great aspects of that historical tradition that went back to Bach and reached to Beethoven and Brahms and so on and ended up in this nightmare of serialism. There were so many great things in it. And, as I said, repetition and songfulness lived in popular music, in the Beatles, in Paul Simon, Stevie Wonder. I'm talking about people who were on the scene at that time when minimalism was coming to the fore. So there were already other options that didn't get rid of melody, didn't get rid of storytelling. They were already out there. Why did we need minimalism at all? We already had pop music, rock, jazz, rhythm and blues, some of which was profoundly great music. Why did we need it? Well, one could argue that we still needed a refined classical music for the refined listening public, whoever they are. And while I could 
make fun of that. The fact is, I love that music too, that more refined, rarefied music by the great composers of the Western canon. So in this sense, Glass and others were working very much in that enclosed system of so-called classical music. And in that sense, they were correct to react against the kind of totalitarianism of serialism, where everything was under control, everything was had to be just so. But one can make the case that in their reaction, they did the same thing but made a much more pleasant version. They still avoided melody. They still avoid melody. I listened to some of this music, hailed by the press, It's now been accepted as genius, and I still don't hear melody. I still don't hear real storytelling. I hear much more of that in great pop music, great jazz. And yet, I will say again, there's still room for a kind of classical music, a more refined instrumental music, if nothing else, than we would get, well, not out of jazz, because jazz is a highly refined, at its best, instrumental music. But you'll never hear great instrumental pop music. It just doesn't really exist. Sorry. So for me, when I listen to Philip Glass, when I listen to minimalism as a whole, I'm always missing that element. Where's the story? It's great as background music, as a kind of wallpaper, the best wallpaper music in the world. And that's unfair too, because Glass goes to great efforts to develop his ideas in a non-narrative form. But it also feels removed from what else is going on in the world. It lacks the bluesiness that is a hallmark of American music. And it feels too neat, too clean, in a sense, untouched by the horrors of history and humanity. That's what I love about blues. It's full of that horror and hope and story. And so I'll leave it there. And I'll leave you with an improvisation called, appropriately enough, Minimally Bluesy. As I said, you can check out the complete tracks for what you've heard today and more on my Bandcamp site. That's petersaltzman.bandcamp.com. All of the tracks are available to subscribers. Some of the tracks are available to non-subscribers, so subscribe. 